Count Wrestling fans, it is I, Steve Fall, and welcome to 10 Count. On today's edition, I'm talking to a man that I'll never pronounce his name correctly. It's Brian Gewertz. How are you doing today? Good, good. That was that was close enough. That's better than Gerwitz, so I'll take it. Well, it's all Bruce Pritchard's fault. Me obsessively yeah, listening to Conrad for years, so I blame them. It's not my fault. Same. No, I agree. So, you know, the... whatever. But look at this. What What is this lovely book behind me? Oh, my. Is that your book? There's just one problem? Is that your book that right now, this is a hard copy. It'll fall over if I hit it too hard. But you have a paperback out right now as well. So if you want to roll that baby up and throw it in a backpack versus this thing, which has seen the world because it has been shoved in every suitcase from Los Angeles to Puerto Rico to London, England. This book is a world traveler. So congratulations, book. And I love this book so much. Thank you. That is that is awesome. Yes. The the paperback as as you know defined by the well the binder less uh thing you know and the uh red across the oh. top with a, with a quote from Dwayne the Rock Johnson um is out but I am I am always you know I always see your your Twitter feed and you're interviewing people and I'm always like like yes I am listening to the interview and the clips and the insightful commentary that you're eliciting. But also, I'm going, he still has the book in the background. Of course. How awesome is that? Yes. Way and I, Thank hey, you. Of course. Of course. It's a great book. And there's many books, you know, in this area. You know, I'll plug one. Well, I interviewed him a few weeks ago. Todd is God, the authorized story of ECW. Unlike the other versions of people sharing their perspectives, he started ECW. Hard copy. But right now, we have the paperback for you. And so much is happening, though, in the wrestling world. And all. But by the way, I do appreciate you. You watching my interviews and seeing your book because it's a nice book and it's a nice color too. It pops, and that's probably one of the main reasons it showed up here. Plus, it's a great read. I've read this book multiple times now, and my wife's like, "What are you doing? Stop! It's not, stop it! Put it down!" Like, no, honey, leave me alone. But as we're talking right now, just last night AEW had an event at Wembley Stadium, breaking records, eighty-one plus thousand people in the arena. Now, what do you think Vince McMahon is thinking when he sees this? Because I was in London for Money in the Bank, and John Cena showed up and was like, WrestleMania in London! And everyone who was kind of in the know was like, I think we know why you're doing this. You're trying to be like, ha, 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 poke you, poke you. But I don't work there. You've worked there. What are your thoughts on what Vince McMahon is thinking right now, seeing these records being broken? You know, honestly, I, I, I this is going to sound maybe like a, uh... False answer or cop yeah. out. I really don't think he cares. I no. really don't. I, I, you know, his attitude. I mean, and I was there. Now, granted, I was. I started at WWE. Uh, you know, on the creative team in 1999 at the November 99. So, yes, there was still the Monday Night Wars technically, but it was, you know, pretty much. Um, you know, there wasn't much warring going on. It was, although, it, although Russo and Ferrara had just left wwe and started a month ago so you really didn't know you know what was going to happen um and yes you know as, as some people pointed out you know there would be in gorilla position in the area right before you, you know, go out through the curtain there'd be monitors and one of them would be tracking you know and have turner on and wcw would be on but it wasn't like you know vince was always focused on his show mm -hmm. and his it, you know he wasn't really concerned at least outwardly, um, you know, with what the competition was doing. He was aware of it, you know, and as saw in the case of, you know, England, in this case, if someone was like, hey, you know, AEW has their thing, maybe we could have, you know, with John Cena to hype thing. All right, go ahead, do it. You know, we'd certainly be cognizant of it, but it wasn't like he was like, how am I going to take those guys down? You know, it wasn't anything like that. He, he's really like, worry about your stuff. And everything will come into, you know, everything will fall into place because you can't control what other people are doing. You can only control what you have right in front of you. And that's what you got to do. Those life lessons you're dropping on us today. Concentrate <laughs> on you. Stay in your own lane. Concentrate yeah. on yourself. But that makes a good point. But when I was there in London, John Cena said that thing. We're all like, uh-huh. Uh, this seems a little weird. I'm fine with it. I understand business is business, but you never mention your competition by name. And certainly one company mentions the other one a million times over. But it, I think to me, it's really bizarre as a wrestling fan. You know, you see the card, you know, whatever, it's the card. But the fact that a company that's only been around for about five years, suddenly selling out 80,000, announcing they're going to go back next year. The rumor, at least as things were going on, 
heading into this was the WWE gets WrestleMania bid on. Many places bid on WrestleMania, which is great for the economy, the hotels, the restaurants, everything. They apparently London, this is the story I'm reading, will they will not ever bid for WrestleMania because there's such a tourist attraction already. They don't need more people here because they're doing fine. And I think that's like, okay, well, if it's a business decision, why go to London for uh, Wembley if you're not going to get paid to go with a product that you can sell? Why give it for free if you can't make money off of it? So I thought that was interesting. But either way, kudos to everyone involved. And uh, so what have you been up to, man? Because there's a lot going on in uh, the world of television and movies we don't have any tv shows it seems coming out soon unless they're maybe a game show and or reality tv and movies uh kind of on the pause so what have you been up to yeah well you know it's certainly not an ideal time right now you know with with two strikes going on and you know obviously we hope we it gets resolved soon and um on a television production standpoint you know, at seven bucks, you know, we're, we're doing what we're essentially, you know, the only path we're really allowed to do, uh, you know, that's developing non-scripted projects, um, non-scripted projects, maybe even delving into the podcast space a little bit, you know, um, comic books, you know, we're going scouting international potential properties or whatever, anything that's, you know, Anything that you can do while two strikes are going on that doesn't involve writing and doesn't involve acting, um, you know, we're looking into it and developing and, you know, honing um, mainly non-scripted projects that, you know, I really, I guess I'll be able to, you know, come back on here and talk about in depth, uh, hopefully soon. Yeah. Um, Hopefully pretty soon. But um, at the moment, yeah, we're just like deep into development on the types of shows that we're allowed to do. Well, you know, hopefully, you know, the writers and actors get what they want and, and you know, we can we can, you know, go back to work full time. Of course, I would, I would love to see that again, because heading into SummerSlam, everyone's like, well, the writers and actors are on strike. The Rock then isn't working. SummerSlam, Ford Field, like everyone thought it was, oh, The Rock's going to obviously show up. But then it kind of got a little weird because he donated a lot of money to the cause, which is awesome for him to do because he didn't have to do it. He did it on his own. And then everyone's thinking, okay, well, can he show up? Can he, as an actor who's on strike, show up and perform on a television program? And he wasn't at SummerSlam. But John Cena then kind of breaks this down as he's going to be on SmackDown this Friday. He's going to wrestle at Superstar Spectacular on September 8th. So can The Rock come compete because John Cena is doing it. Why can't the rock? Well, well, first of all, I would say even with uh, the strikes going, um, I will have to, I'll have to go back for a second and say he is, uh, despite, you know, not working on a film acting. He's busy. He's definitely working. Yeah. 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 Of course. <laughs> We've got, um, as I'm like getting awake through the Zoa energy drink and the XFL and Terramana Tequila and Project Rock on Under Armour. There's a lot of ventures yeah. of stuff going on. Um, you know, I, you know, I was asked this before on another podcast. I, I thought that, um, you know, my mindset is, you know, if you're an actor or performer, um, you know, typically doing TV and movies and that kind of thing, that it's not a great look to then go on, you know, WWE and be performing while these strikes are going on. Uh, everyone has their own, you know, mindset. Uh, if I know WWE, I know, you know, I'm thinking this deal with John Cena, especially if he's booked to wrestle overseas or wherever, wherever superstar, superstar spectacular is, um, has been, you know, ink to paper a long time ago. Mm. Something that was just, you know, oh, let's do it this week kind of thing. Uh, I think it's probably, you know, again, this is just my guess. I don't know um a contractual thing that they've agreed to and what have you but um you know everyone has their own mindset i think from a from a legal standpoint um you know i don't think there's anything illegal or anything like that there isn't wwe is not a struck company uh you know their actors you know while some are in sag they're you know to perform on raw or smackdown isn't a sag job to perform uh, creative duties isn't a WGA job or a DGA job or a PGA job if you're 
producing or directing. They're kind of in their own, you know, uh, universe, so to speak. So, yeah, I think it's up to the individual what they want to do. Um, and certainly if, if things were, you know, agreed to upon months ago, um, you know, I could see them, you know, sticking to it. Um, but yeah, I, I don't think, again, I haven't talked to The Rock about it or anything like that. But, you know, I think it's one of those things where, you know, as people are striking and really like fighting, you know, the studios for, um, you know, fair pay and 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 all the other things that come with, you know, striking, that it's, you know, not the greatest look in the world, you know, to just go, all right, well, good luck, guys. I'm going to be uh, performing live in the middle of the ring on Raw this Monday, you know, kind of thing. Uh, again, nothing illegal about it. And everyone has their own, you know, POV and that kind of thing. That's just, uh, it's just mine. Yeah, of course. I have seen uh, a couple stories about smaller movies getting some sort of agreement that they could go uh, promote some film somewhere. And I was like, interesting that you can like get to do what you're supposed to be doing, but not the full extent of it. And that's why I think everyone was like, The Rock, ah, and then you don't need money. Everyone's like, mm. I don't think this is going to happen. And then John Cena showed up. Now, the, I think the floodgates have opened of the, everyone's mind thinking anyone anywhere can just get a call from the WWE and be like, hey, Hugh Jackman, want to wrestle? Like, oh, OK, well, I'm not working. So come on off. Sure. Because it's not like The Rock or even Hugh Jackman. When this strike ends and they say did go on Raw or wrestled and they return, it's not like they're going to be pushed out. It's going to be like, well, welcome back. Let's make money again. Versus if it was somewhere who's smaller actor shows up and does that well there might be consequences i have no idea but uh, that's that's a theory altogether but uh in your book though you tell many stories about edge and christian recently on a smackdown episode edge uh, it seemed like he had his last match in the wwe against sheamus uh, later on announcing that his contract ends september he hasn't signed a new one yet so we're lead to believe that hey he's done and we don't know what's next more wwe aew go be an actor again do whatever you want. So what are your thoughts on this? 25 years of Edge and they might be over. Yeah, well, it's if if it is, if it is over and I haven't talked to Edge, I haven't talked to Adam, you know, Copeland about it or anything like that. Yeah. Um, he certainly, in my opinion, doesn't have any anything to look back on and go, oh, if only I had done that. Right. He's had a pretty full, amazing career over 25 years. He's going to be um you know 50 in november he's a husband and father um he has a you know budding acting career he has you know pretty much he could do whatever he sets his mind to do at this point so i don't know i don't know physically you know he came back you know everyone was astonished when he came back at the royal rumble a few <laughs> years ago and didn't really miss a step and didn't miss a beat. And Jay Christian is back too in AEW. And it's really astonishing and also, you know, heartwarming to see. Um, but yeah, you know, like uh, myself, Edge and Christian, we work together um, very closely at WWE. We're all the same age. I'm, I'm, I'm the oldest of the three of us because their birthdays are in November. We're all born the same year. Um you know, and I could tell you, you know, I'm not performing and wrestling and taking bumps and everything like that. And I'm certainly, you know, I used to like, oh, I'll run at uh, nine miles an hour on the treadmill. Now it's like, eh, let's make it six. <laughs> <laughs> I worked out, honey. I did it. Yeah. I, let's let's do a brisk walk. Um, you know, so I could, you know, it, it's not um, it's not something that is easy to get up and take bumps. And even when you're in your prime, much less you know, getting, uh, getting a, getting an unwanted and unasked for a AARP card in the mail. Um, but yeah, you know, like, uh, I don't know if he, if he wants to sign like uh, WWE on a, you know, be a semi attraction as they used to call it, yeah. uh, and work a couple dates at when he sees fit, that's cool. As a fan, if you were to go to AEW and team with Christian again and, and do a little, little run there. I think that would be cool too. I don't think there would be, I don't know. I don't, I have no idea, but I don't think there are like, you know, you're dead to us hard feelings, you know, between AEW and WWE talent. I don't think there are. I think if Chris Jericho, for instance, ever wanted to come back or Daniel Bryan or, or whoever, whoever wanted to come back to WWE at a certain point or be inducted in the hall of fame, um, you know, history shows that everyone eventually does come back. 
This so, is true. You know, uh, I think it's like whatever Adam, whatever Edge is feeling right now. I think it would be, I, as a fan, I'd love to see him and Christian, even though um, character wise, you know, Edge is, you know, this beloved, I've used the comparison, Dave Grohl like. Yeah. Uh, you know, performer now where it's like, oh, he's been through a lot. He's achieved them tremendous heights. Everyone loves him. He's the genuine article, family man, et cetera. And Christian Jay on AEW, um, despite having all those same similarities, basically, you know, same career path and also, you know, a father and everything else um, is really, you know, letting his inner scumbag uh, just come out in ways that we never had seen in WWE. So, they're definitely um, different, very vastly different characters currently right now. But um, I'd still, I'd still, uh, as a fan, love to see them work together. A AEW, WWE, some weird independent show, whatever, <laughs> whatever it is. But uh, yeah. if Edge were to decide to retire right now from the ring and never perform and wrestle again, um, I think you know it's pretty safe to say that. Uh, you know, he's had a full career and could leave that ring pretty satisfied. Oh, yeah. And especially in 2011 when he had to retire from injury thinking it's all over. And now he has the choice to decide, does he want it to be over versus being forced to have it over, which was such a, that was a sad day. There were a lot of tears in my house that day. Uh, him and AEW sounds great. I think, though, like you brought it up and there's an there is an AEW WWE war, but it's not between wrestlers. It's between uh, fans. And unfortunately, if Edge showed up, they'd say, well, Edge was never great. He was never good in the WWE. But didn't you just say he was amazing last week? No, I, I deleted that tweet. I deleted that tweet. Like, that's to me, I can't imagine seeing like Shawn Michaels in AEW. You know what I mean? Like seeing Shawn Michaels in WCW in 98 would have made me throw up. I, I, I would have been shocked. So in today's world, Edge going to AEW, I, I could see it because there was a documentary that came out a few years ago where he revealed that he was talking to them before they even started on TV to go. But he went to the WWE. He kind of said, hey, this is what's happening. You want me back? And they're like, here you go. Blank check, probably. So we'll, we'll see what happens next with that. But, um, man, I don't know what's next for Edge, but man, great career. Great career. Though, yeah. uh, unfortunately, two careers – uh, recently ended in the wrestling world. Terry Funk and Bray Wyatt both passed away. It seemed so close to each other. In the wrestling world, Terry Funk, to me, will always go down as, uh, for me, when I introduced him, he was Chainsaw Charlie. And that was my introduction to him, and I love Chainsaw Charlie. But then when you go back and you watch all these other Terry Funk matches with Ric Flair and so on and so forth, Mick Foley, you're like, dude, like this guy influenced so many people after him. But Bray Wyatt, same exact way, that his promos... His demeanor, his attitude, everything about him. Like, do you have any Terry Funk and Bray Wyatt stories? Because I would appreciate hearing some. Because right now, I think a lot of people just are going through like a transition of like, is this real? Yeah, no, it is tremendously sad week. Um, and you know, Terry Funk, obviously a legend and just a like a true dynamic presence. Um, I my fan experience with Terry Funk. Um, was before Chainsaw Charlie because I, you know, caught him at Nassau Coliseum, um, you know, back when he had first entered WWF and was doing the whole thing with the branding iron, I think. Oh, yeah. Um, and and either the ring announcer had put on his hat and he attacked the ring announcer in a battle royal. And it was like, and maybe it was with him and JYD. I don't remember, but it was like something where they they both won the battle royal, so they're gonna share it. And then he went nuts and started attacking everybody. And it was just like a real in a gimmick in, in a very gimmick filled world of 80s WWF at the time. You know, he stood out as well, this guy is really real and dangerous. Yeah, <laughs> you yeah. know, to me, yeah. your old man watching, like, uh, I don't know. I, you know, this isn't like uh yeah, I think he's actually in. I don't think he has a line. I think he actually is in the Land of a Thousand Dances music video. If you if you look carefully, just like you know, doing the thing and clapping. <laughs> but he, he is an entity all to his own. Obviously, when you get older, when I got older and started knowing more about the history of the business and and, and tracking, you know, like oh my god, he, he wasn't the you know the the guy with the branding iron from wwf he's just like so he's this 
unbelievable legend. And, yeah. um, you know, I, I didn't really, from a working standpoint, I never really, I, I got to meet him at the uh, ECW, one of the ECW slash WWE uh, pay-per-views. Oh, okay. Uh, and, and he just, you know, he's holding court and just seeming like, you know, like all the stories that you hear, you hear from Mick and you hear from Bruce Pritchard and all those type of things. Like I, I was just in a fan zone where I didn't even want to engage in conversation because I just wanted to step back and just watch him. Um, Cause it's amazing. He was like working. I was probably like in his fifties or sixties, you know, when uh, probably in the sixties or something like that, when, when I saw him. Um, yeah. 2006 but, is the time he performed at the ECW one night stand. So I'm guessing that's the year. Yeah. Yeah. yeah that probably is it. So he was 79 when he passed away and that was, yeah, I, I don't know. I, can't do third grade math in my head but it was it's just a remarkable remarkable performer and his influence on you know wrestling and fans and performers themselves um you know not to mention all the you know the movies and roadhouse and all those <laughs> type of things um just like truly 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 great performer um you know bray wyatt obviously i worked with um you know, from a behind the scenes standpoint, I didn't, um, I didn't really work with him, um, in the Bray Wyatt phase outside of, outside of WrestleMania 32, which was, that was really the special, um, you know, promo and time where I got to work with Bray slash Wyndham. Um, because when I was on the road at WWE, he had been called up as part of like, whatever the new Nexus thing oh, yeah. was. Yeah. And that, yeah. And that was when, that was when WWE uh, had, I don't know, that was when they were going through their, I'll call it their horrible name phase, uh-huh. um, where, I don't know if it was Vince, somebody really was into corny alliteration at the time. Um, we had Husky Harris and Michael McGillicuddy yeah. and, you know, these other names that like seemed like something out of like a 1940s movie. <laughs> um, but, I could, but I could tell, you know, I worked with his dad obviously um you know behind the scenes mike uh legendary you know wrestler um and he had been working as a backstage producer you know for years when i was there um and i could you know i could tell like you know from bray's standpoint obviously husky harris wasn't something that he wanted to do but at the same time you get called up and you get like an opportunity to perform on television uh you're you're you know, we're really not in a position to say anything otherwise. So, you know, he kind of like took his, paid his dues, I guess. Yeah. Uh, but you could tell that there was a lot more going on in the, uh, you know, in the brain than um, being part of a group. Yes, you're on television and yes, you're getting exposure and, and you're even working with top talent, but you're really not, um, I don't have much opportunity to show your personality and show what you're capable of. So it was really like, post nexus 2.0 bray coming back and him him being Wyndham putting in the work and the effort and the creativity to emerge as this brand new character this hypnotic mesmerizing character yeah i've always uh, he's so i don't know I, I i likened it to this i like imagine like 1920s basketball where they're all like throwing it through a peach basket and you know doing all those uh old timey moves and everything yeah. and then lebron lebron shows up <laughs> you're like i can't even compartmentalize what this there yes we're technically playing the same sport but this person is on a completely different level yes than anything we've ever witnessed before um and that was that was bray wyatt because he like as a writer on the creative team there, there were and this happens to everybody i think on the creative team you get sometimes you get stuck in a funk where you're like Oh my God, this has been done before. And this has been done. Everything's been done before. Wow, how could we possibly do something new when like literally every story, every every iteration of wrestling, yes, that's just like McMahon and Austin, or yes, that's just like Hogan versus Andre or whatever. Um, and here comes Bray doing stuff that had never been seen before. And it is all coming out of his brain. The promos, the you know, the first time you saw Firefly Funhouse, like my brain was like, what is this? This is, yeah. this is insane. This is hypnotic. 
when he's doing like the dance and the song and the Vince puppet <laughs> and the match with Cena at, at you know, the, the COVID WrestleMania and yeah. all that stuff. Um, it was, it was truly mind bending. And that all comes from Bray. That wasn't Bray sitting down. Uh, you know, he worked with, I know he worked with, you know, several, uh, you know, members of the creative team and collaborated with them, but he was the driving force behind all of his stuff. Um, you know, even when we worked together at WrestleMania 32 with, with the rock, um, you know, the way we, you know, we wanted to, I know talking to rock, it was like this guy, Bray Wyatt, he doesn't have a match. This is the promo we should, you know, be doing. That's like basically what we discussed with each other is like equally, you know, uh, rock wanted to work with him. Uh, I wanted rock to work with him. Uh, and Bray obviously would, you know, when would be more than happy to to do a segment with the rock but even when we put that segment together it was like all right and then bray you'll say your stuff i'll just let you do it because i'm certainly not writing anything for bray wyatt it's like you know here's the outline whatever you say rock will respond to um and there's not you know that's sort of like a it's not necessarily a given with with a lot of performers a lot a lot of performers can you know and do write their own promos um, but Bray, from the start, from the incarnation of the Bray Wyatt character, it was all him uh, putting forth the character, the aura, the mood, the atmosphere. Um, and he's just really, really remarkable. And it's so, and I guess as I'm rambling on here, the other thing I would, I would add is that in putting that promo together, the one key in that promo that we wanted to do above everything else is rock putting Bray over. Yeah. Uh, Because usually there's this dynamic where the heel comes out and maybe there's a line, a certain, you know, lip service or whatever of like, yeah, you're a great athlete, but blah, 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 blah. You know, and typically when with heel baby face, not, you know, exclusive rock or anything like that. But it was like, no, in this particular case, we really, you know, we have the spotlight on us. Every, the world of wrestling is watching um, this is a good opportunity for The Rock to really put over the dynamic, dynam, the dynamic personality, <laughs> the magnetic presence, the fact that people, you know, he's supposedly a heel and 101,000 people are holding up their cell phones. Like I always thought, certainly at the time at WrestleMania 32, that Bray Wyatt character should transcend babyface heel He's just this agent of chaos and and you could either like him or not like him. I didn't like that he was sometimes pigeonholed as, okay, but you got to be a heel because wrestling is baby faces and heels. Um, you know, because I thought he was just, just an anomaly in the sense that he just like transcends that and it's much more than that. So we definitely took that opportunity for The Rock and the fans responded too, by the way. The fans, as The Rock, if you go back and watch the promo, when The Rock's talking about how He's got the look, he's got the charisma, he's got, you know, this magnetic power about him. And, and of course, you can't teach this stuff, and I couldn't teach it, but like, you know, Bray and Rock with the, with the presence to, you know, take that moment, take their time, acknowledge the crowd, they're popping, they're responding to it. There's not a what in the building during the time where lots of what's would happen. <laughs> where Ray and Rock would go back and forth. Everyone was truly listening to hear what they would have to say. Um, so yeah, that was really that was really great to be able to uh, to you know work on that promo with those guys. And yeah, it's 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 just a shocking, horrible loss. You know, not only from a wrestling standpoint. Obviously, that's like a, that's the lower part of it from the human being standpoint. Yeah. And and William, you know, being a father and a and a husband and son and every every tribute that you see, um, both for Terry Funk and Bray Wyatt, you know, these are like genuine outpouring of emotion because of the human beings that they are, um, not because oh well, this is what you do when someone passes away. Like no, this is like truly truly universally um, beloved individuals, uh, and it's really really you know, it's horrible. You know, it's, 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 a, it's bad. I'm, I'm, you know, I can't even really talk, <laughs> talk it through when you're talking about like a 36 year old performer in the prime of his life, yeah. uh, unexpectedly passing away. Uh, it's just, it's a beyond tragic. Um, but his legacy is going to continue pretty much forever. Yeah. 
I, I I agree with you when you mentioned kind of the heel and baby face situation of his his character on television. The fact that his his children and his wife no longer have him. I'm I'm a father of three. I have a wife. Like I I would I can't imagine in your brain not being there to help your family at any point in time, but especially now, you know, you're going to be remembered as one of the greatest performers of all time, but also probably a great father and a great husband as well. Um, I didn't know him like that, but the, the heel baby face thing you brought, brought up is a really good point because it seemed like everything is like going right for him. And then he fought John Cena at WrestleMania 30. And it was like, well, cause that was the year everyone thought like all these new stars were being built, but they just got beat by all the already established people. And then it's like, yeah, but he beat John Cena at Extreme Rules the next month. Like, are you, are you being serious? Are you comparing WrestleMania to Extreme Rules? Because they're because they're not the same thing. And as time would go on, I think like you brought up a really good point is like Eddie Guerrero, people appreciated him when he was alive, but not as much as when he wasn't here anymore. And Bray Wyatt is going to be all his promos. People are going to study those things. The White Rabbit, him returning, uh, the Firefly Funhouse, er er everything like that, because that, again, you brought it up all from his brain, a little bit of help, but a lot of bit is from him and he killed it every time. I was a huge Bray Wyatt fan. I didn't want to say he's the next Undertaker, but people compared him because he had mystical powers. The lights would go out, boom, he'd appear. And uh, he definitely brought something different to the wrestling world. And I love different because, you know, I like your blue trunks and your blue boots when you come out and have a great match. But you know what I like more? A scary guy telling me to run, holding a lantern, blowing it out. Like, I like that. Well, you know, yeah. I and mean, we talked about it before, you know, the ascension um, or progression from WWE to film and television with Rock and Cena and Batista uh, and several others have made inroads. But, you know, in the back of my mind and back of probably lots and lots of people's minds, um, that was where you could easily see, you know, Bray Wyndham yeah. ascending to uh, because he's such a good actor and such a good performer and has such great instincts and so genuine because you know this this scary guy this horror character is really ahead of his time um you know in in a wrestling world it's difficult in a wrestling world it's not easy when you know you're sitting in the rocking chair going back and forth and talking about you know these cryptic promos otherworldly type promos but at the end of the day your goal is supposedly pin someone's shoulders to the mat for a count of three and, or get them to submit in order to win a championship. Yes. You know, the, the motivation and the goals aren't necessarily, you know, aligned in that particular case. Um, and so it's a challenge sometimes to have them be aligned. It's like, yes, then what is, if you're not trying to be champion, then what are you doing? Well, Bray Wyatt is yes. operating on a much different, you know, plane than everyone else. Um, I would have loved, you know, uh, to, you know, like everyone, you know, um, basically, yeah, I agree. Go back, treasure the materials that you that we do have, the uh, legacy that he left as as far as a performer. Um, but you could see, you could, you know, all these outpouring of, uh, you know, the tributes that are coming. Mm. Um, you could tell, you could just tell, and even if, whether you knew him or didn't know him, what a genuine human being he was above as the above of being a performer and he was a remarkable performer even more valued and even more loved and treasured you know as a human being yeah and the fiend the fiend gave children nightmares and they'll remember those forever i remember watching um football on a sunday and it was like the fiend just showed up and so that fox was playing commercial for the first time ever for smackdown and i was like watching it and out of nowhere it's like smackdown it's friday do 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 and i went Bleh! there's the fiend's face and suddenly trending on twitter was like scary man and i'm like what is scary man i click on it and it was everyone who didn't know what the fiend was all being like this thing I freaked me out I'm trying to watch football ah! it was it was a it was a great moment so I hope someone keeps those nightmares in their brain because <laughs> Bray Wyatt will always be there I used to vo I used to call people on the phone doing Bray Wyatt voices and just leave voicemails I loved him so much so I, I cried when he passed away I never met him I saw him at a press conference once 10 feet away from me asked him a question that was it but I fe I could feel his presence in uh through the tv and man it sucks but you know, so much is more happening in the WWE. Like this weekend is payback, and then they're going to Fast Lane, and they have Survivor Series, uh, Royal Rumble, maybe in Orlando. But WrestleMania is going to Philly next year, two nights, already sold over 90,000 tickets, not one match announced. 
to me, um, right now wrestling is. I want to pick your brain a little bit. Do you, why do you feel like wrestling is doing so well in a lot of markets? Stock market prices above Disney, uh, making more money, going to live events, selling out. Why do you feel like this is happening? You know, I need I need to be uh, careful with this response because I was asked this question. I was asked a question about Attitude oh. Era versus now. Oh no! And what'd, you, which, what'd you say? What'd you say, Brian? Well, the funny thing here's the thing. Um, in advocating for the Attitude Era, as far as the cultural phenomenon of WWE and wrestling, yes. you know, will never be bigger than that time. And Agreed. and from a you know from from a streaming standpoint and from a when people are watching and the buzz and the only way you can watch is right, right now kind of thing. It could 10 million people every week. It can never be topped and it can never be topped as far as the, the cultural impact and the ascension of where it was a few years ago versus, you know, what it became in the late nineties. Mm -hmm. So in doing all that to give this current era, it's proper due. I pointed out like, well, let me first just point out everything WWE and wrestling in general is doing right right now as far as like the money it's making the respectability that has in in hollywood and elsewhere uh the women's you know division and the leaps and bounds that it's made and then i got into my thesis but a lot of the um the Uh. wrestling site didn't bother to listen to the second half they just took the first half the preface and said, you know, so and so Brian claims that more buzz now than, but I'm like, that's literally the opposite of the point I was trying to make. So, thank you for that. You know you how this, be... you know how this works, though, right? You you say something and they just twist your words. You never seen that Simpsons episode? The Simpsons got they're on it. Marge goes, "I bet you could just take my words if I said I hate America," and then they cut out the front and they put Marge Simpson yeah. hates America. Yeah, kind of happened to Rowdy you. Rowdy Keeper, um, groundskeeper. <laughs> <laughs> you, did you see that Piper reference on uh, The Simpsons? I think it was from that episode. Oh, it no. The classic episode. Yeah. It's like when Homer takes the gummy, the gummy candy off of the babysitter, and but it was on her butt. So he took it and he was cru- accused of groping her. Yes. And he became like, you know, essentially canceled 20, 15 years before that became a term. And then, you know, it, it all got resolved. But then they were like, oh, we have another story. And it's basically Groundskeeper Willie. Uh, and his perverted whatever dealings from his shed. And they said, Rowdy Roddy Keeper. <laughs> <laughs> Got a Roddy reference on The Simpsons. Um, awesome. What were we talking about? No. Uh, this, no so this, it, you, how you got in trouble for saying the Attitude Era was better than today. Yes, I remember that was what you said. Yeah, well, I, I got in trouble for not saying it, even though I did say it. Mm. But um, yeah, but this era today is... You know, well, basically, it's the same thing that I, that I said in, in the preface of the other, you know, of the other thesis statement. Um, I, you know, lamented when we went to TV PG, uh, PG-13 or whatever, 14 to regular PG, um, because I thought it was like, like, we didn't go to PG. We went to G. Yeah. And it was very, very safe. And it was very almost Muppet-like. Um, you know, in terms of what we can do and what we can't do. Um, don't get me wrong, I love the Muppets, but it should they hosted, be- They hosted you know, the Raw. Muppets. They hosted Raw, so. It was a great episode, yes. <laughs> um, and it's, yeah, it, it makes sense that they would during that time. Um, but what it did do is it kind of like put the brakes on the how can we top ourselves this week in terms of the outrageousness and, you know, going over the line- mm. And that late 2002, 2003 period, the Katie Vick period, which we don't want to say too loudly, um, which was like a remnant of, we got to keep the Attitude Era going somehow, but it's over, but we got to still be outrageous. Yeah. And, you know, Vince ultimately made the decision of, we have to take a step back, maybe even two or three steps back and gain a little bit more in this, you know, I don't think he ever said, I want to be the Disney of, you know, wrestling, but that was essentially like, yes, we want to, we want to be accepted, not just the, having the 18 to 34 year old uh, male audience as, as WWE and Nitro captured in the late nineties, early two thousands was great. Um, But ultimately we want to be safe for younger viewers as well. 
and families because families you know those kids who want to go to the show their parents are the ones who buy the tickets and go with them um so we had to really it, there was a concentrated effort to take a step back and be much more safer and family friendly doesn't mean you can't have compelling stories and we certainly you know attempted to do that sometimes successfully sometimes not but doing that even though on the creative team i hated you know the the restrictions i guess you could say because it was like really you know super and like no you can't say that word or you can't you know the person you need to change that jbl is poopy is always one that reminds me of that time jbl is poopy is written on is written on his limo Hmm. yes i got um online again uh um scorn for that despite the fact that i think john cena wrote that on the spot just to give me scorn um, I think oh. he came back after that and was like, yeah, they're going to have a field day without one. Um, but what that did really was open, really, basically, it made the product safer. And it was the tipping point as far as the change in terms of Hollywood respectability, parent respectability, all that kind of stuff where you see now, which uh, WWE really is like the Disney of wrestling it's you know global it's not you know all the stuff that you would in terms of language in terms of the way you know women are presented the way all those things from the attitude era that um really wouldn't fly today um you know wwe was rightfully kind of ahead of the curve in terms of shifting and changing that because at a certain point like what can you do to top yourself it's one of the reasons why um the hardcore title went away you know, back in the day, because it was like, like, okay, well, now we did all these things, like, you're gonna have to defy the laws of physics to to keep this going and top yourself. Because all these things that happened, it was one of the problems with Hell in a Cell, too, where we had, there was an issue with Hell in a Cell, where everyone was just kind of waiting for, okay, that's nice, okay, they're doing the thing, when's someone gonna fall off of it? Yes. Or when's someone gonna take a crazy bump off of it? And it's kind of killing the hell in the cell because you can have a great, awesome match inside hell in the cell without one big crazy bump. Um, But audiences had been, you know, trained to expect the Foley bump, the Rikishi bump, um, the Shane bump, whatever it was. So it was kind of like that analogy. It's kind of like the same for the product overall. Um, There had to be a shift and they made the shift. And, you know, some fans accepted it kicking and screaming. Some fans went away. Some fans were like, um, all right, well, I'll watch the highlights then on social media or whatever it was. But boy, did it, I'll, say, I'll put it this way, you know, the night after Katie Vick, um, our stock price, the WWE stock price was well in the single digits. Mm. It had dropped from whatever it was in the teens uh, to 8.72. Uh, I know because I had a lot of stock. <laughs> You're like, well, that didn't work. Yeah, duly noted. And now it's, you know, whatever it is, like over 115 or something like that. Yeah. Uh, and that comes from having a product that is, um, you know, accepted and in Americana, as Vince would say, even though now it's completely global. <laughs> and it, And that all stemmed from the PG era. So I think... That, I think, you know, the fact that we mentioned before, you see the ascension of Rock and Batista and Cena, uh, you know, making not only, you know, inroads in Hollywood as far as cameos and stuff like that, but legitimate movie stars. Oh, yeah. Uh, And you see Seth Rollins is going to be in a Marvel movie. Um, You know, I had a great opportunity to work with Becky Lynch on Young Rock this past season as Cindy Lauper, where she killed it. Um, and then there's more of that coming, if not already happening. Um, so yeah, you have a lot more, ex- it's, it's much more the WWE, um, is much more accepted mainstream wise. And there's a lot of very, very smart, uh, marketing people and executives behind the scene, who, behind the scenes who are making these deals that are taking WWE to places they'd never even been to before. Uh, and all of that, you know, in addition to the product and the performers and everything else uh, has a lot to do with, you know, the just boatloads of money that they're making now that uh, was a struggle to, uh, you know, get that acceptance and that profitability in the past. Yeah. 
Uh, you know, you brought up a really good point because I, you know, I started watching in 92, so I'm 37, going on 38 soon. And the Attitude Era, I could go to a gas station and they had Beanie Babies. They said Austin 316 on them or NWO on them. You could go anywhere. It didn't matter what store was selling what product. You could find a WWE knockoff or a real version of it. That's where global, like, that's when it was the coolest, the coolest thing in the world. In today's world, it's not the coolest thing in the world, but it's making a lot of money because of the transition you brought up from PG, and it was some growing pains, my friend, some big old growing pains. And then you, right, yeah, yeah, you were there. I, I was, I was, I was suffering. I was suffering. And then suddenly, you know, you get to this new type of era where Bad Bunny wants to perform and Logan Paul wants to perform and you have every month a new Slim Jim or Mountain Dew or something giving them a lot of money just to call this match the Slim Jim Battle Royal or the Mountain Dew match but guess what those checks are clearing and I obviously money's being made more now than then but I don't like when people today discredit what happened then like if you didn't live through it or go through it, you don't understand that you couldn't go to a high school or a middle school or anywhere and not see a wrestling show. That's not the case today. They might be selling more, but they're not everywhere. Yeah, no, I'd agree with that. I'd, I'd even say even before the Attitude Era or the rock and wrestling era of the mid 80s oh, as Hogan? well. Had, yes. You know, Saturday Night's main event doing just you know mind-boggling numbers yep. certainly mind-boggling numbers when compared to today's tv ratings but even back then in its day yep. doing incredible numbers uh you know those every six weeks when it would replace snl or whatever it was uh you know i don't i don't know if people understand the scope of how huge it was to see you know the war to settle the score on mtv if you go back when and go happened. on YouTube and yeah. watch the little clips of, you know, you sit back and you go, oh, who's Geraldine Ferraro is talking about? Who's that? And it's like, oh, no, she was the first woman vice presidential candidate it, during that time. Yeah. Like this was 85. She had just run in 84, much less Tina Turner. And uh, it, well, obviously, Cindy Lauper. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And this is a slew of celebrities only, that were huge. Collins, like huge stars, um, you know, talking about wrestling, which had, you know, been, you know, we, you know, we know the history and everything. It, it had, not, it had been, you know, regional. It had been, you know, huge within its bubble. But you know, the seeing again, seeing T Tina Turner cut a promo on Rowdy Roddy <laughs> Piper, uh, it really, it had never been, and nothing like that had ever happened before in Attitude Era. You know, again, over 10 million people watching Raw and Nitro on a Monday night. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, the combined numbers approaching Monday night football numbers on certain weeks. Um, the the just the fact, even you know, people nowadays nowadays them kids, nowadays clouds make me angry. You know, like on the cover of TV Guide, like what is TV Guide? What are you talking? Do I have one of those. WWE. Down here? Oh, I do. I do have it right here. Yeah, uh, That's oh my god! And you know what's even better? I have you, buddy. There you go. TV Guide with the Rock, folks. Look at that. Let, let's what's let's see, well, honey. What's on Saturday night at seven fifty-five? Oh, Arthur's on. Arthur. Hmm. So, ah, oh, interesting. But yes, this is how you found out what was on TV. Little kids are watching my show <laughs> right now. TV guides. You couldn't just talk into your phone and get all your answers. You had to do the work. Yeah, that was. They had. Um, I think they had. You know, four different covers. Don't make me pull I think, them out. Uh, I'll do it. Yeah, Austin. I think McFoley. China might have been on one of them. And I got, again, like, I got the Kurt Angle one. Oh yeah, that was. Uh, they did it again a few years later. And then, Why do you have them all? This is presidential McFoley. Yes. So he. This one be, must must be the one running for president. So this got to be like two thousand. Uh. Yeah, mankind for president. Would I vote for mankind? Eh, probably not. Um, I think that's all I got I'd down there. <laughs> what? I'd vote for Mick Foley. I don't know if I'd vote for mankind, but I definitely would vote for Mick Foley. In, maybe, maybe in, dude uh, love. Any... Yeah, I'd vote for dude love. But, but he, yeah, this was like a a gigantic cultural phenomenon 
yeah. that was WWE in the Attitude Era that really, like you said, Beanie Babies in the, the, <laughs> the gas, gas station. station level of popularity that like, yeah, you you know, you, household names. Like there, there's a lot of great performers right now. Um, I don't think they had, you know, they current, whatever performer you want to really pick out yeah. has the cultural impact that an Austin or a Rock or DX or Undertaker or yeah. Goldberg, Goldberg on the cover of Entertainment Weekly, you know, back in 1999 with the headline, how did wrestling become so big? Um, you know, all of that stuff is just, it was a magical era that really, you know, due to, in, in part due to, you know, the segmentation and the fragmenting of how we watch our content nowadays, um, you know, really can't be replicated anymore. It's, it's, it's truly an era that should not be, oh yeah, that was, it was that little blip on the radar there. I guess they were popular for a little bit, but you know, uh, but to, it's nothing compared to today. It was like, no, we, you gotta, you do, you really do have to, uh, you know, give that era uh, it's props as far as you know just the tidal wave of popularity mm -hmm. that that ensued from it of course and like you brought it up how we all consume products is so different from 1998 watching raw there was only like 60 channels on cable i couldn't watch raw repeats if you missed it you missed it there was no way to watch it again unless you had a vcr and you knew how to time it properly which no one did i don't want to hear no. you ever tried to record something on the vcr with the proper time you didn't you got the wrong show liars oh, i and, tried to record nitro and like why do i have craig kilborn on uh comedy central <laughs> i'm trying to take nobody nitro. knows nobody, nobody knows those buttons did not work they were just there for looks uh though i think that people today and i will try not to sound like an old man but it's different as a fan in like 98 it, you it took dedication like you had to go watch it at this time you had to do this you had to do that in today's world i can go well, there's so much wrestling now. Before, there's only a couple of days a week. Now, it's like every day. I can't consume it all when it's live on TV. I have other things to do. I'll record it. and then Or go on Twitter and just read what's happening before you have to go to a wrestling website and go, okay, what's happening? Oh, so-and-so beat so-and-so. Okay, I'll refresh in a little while and figure it out. Twitter is just giving me instant gratification so I don't have to put on your program to watch you. So I guess everywhere you look from – Merchandise sales to streaming to anywhere, wrestling in general is just consumed completely different than we ever would have seen before. And, but I will never, ever let someone disparage the Attitude Era where it was something that will never be duplicated again. Like Beatles rock and roll, Elvis rock and roll. It was an era that cannot be topped ever. And I don't want anyone to ever say, because, well, we make more money now. Yeah, but. You're not a cultural phenomenon. I love you so much, WWE. Please don't hurt me when I come to see you in Detroit. And and uh, what am I going, to go next time? Pittsburgh this weekend for payback. So please don't hurt me. Um, but all in all, I think it has been a pleasure talking to you about everyone underneath the sun. But I would like one story that's not in your book. Maybe you can give me one. A Shane McMahon story. I was at WrestleMania this past year. And oh boy, I was excited to see him. He's juking. He's jiving. And then he just stopped juking and jiving. And I said, oh no. Oh, Shane. Oh, Shane. And, I, and he went down. He went down like me walking up the stairs. Trying to run up the stairs. That ain't happening. Walking? Sure. So give me a Shane McMahon story because not the one where he kind of ruined his leg. But, you know, anything we don't know. Well, first of all, Shane is awesome. Uh, and I didn't, you know, as I wrote in the book, I'll, I will preface it with a book story. Like I didn't. Oh, this book right I here? Think, yes, that's the one. That you can buy right now in paperback? Yeah. There's and still just one problem. And on cover. I could have both? You could. I could have both? <laughs> <laughs> Shane is like, you know, Shane is a Yankees fan, turns out. So in my interview, when I first interviewed at WWE, I interviewed with Rusum Ferrara first, well, HR first, then Rusum Ferrara, then Shane, later Vince. And again, I gave the, the worst interview you could possibly ever give. Uh, it is somewhat of a miracle that I eventually got hired. Because um, when he asked about why I wanted to return to New York, I was living in Los Angeles at the time, instead of like, oh, well, I, I love this company and I want to take advantage of this great opportunity to provide some creativity to the world of sports entertainment and WWE. I had said something along the lines of like, it is impossible to get a sports bar to get the Mets games on in Los Angeles, which it was. Uh, so I'm looking forward to not having to do that anymore. And he's just looking at me 
rightfully so like a like a insane person and like yeah well i'm a yankees fan and i'm like wow well shane uh shane <laughs> i don't really think uh we're going to be striking up a friendship but the fact of the matter is is that shane is like one of the warmest kindest you know he exudes empathy i don't know if people know that about him but he truly is i'll give this is not in the book is is an example you know everyone goes through their ribbing period their initiation so to speak we had a show in i think either rochester or buffalo this was this was so early this was before wwe had a corporate jet which they pretty much obtained in 2000 so this is probably late 99 i had just started uh and it, even though it was a very very slow um a very very sorry fast flight from rochester to new york i think i had a breakfast sandwich beforehand and it was one of those landings um and so it was like a really bumpy landing uh and i was really super queasy as we rode in a limo back to stamford uh it was me shane bruce pritchard and jr and jr and bruce even though i i love them dearly today and then love them at the time too but or like them at the time love them now um <laughs> you know they're seeing the new kid like looking green in the car and uh you know jr is like what'd you have one of them biscuits one of them eggs and biscuits and bacon and like just really really uh you know pouring it on where the, i had to just ask them to pull over and uh go out into a snowbank and essentially this is disgusting but basically had to throw up yeah like throw up. landing the breakfast and the <laughs> words just you know was just a bad bad scene um and i'm like wow this is I was riding high, riding on an NBC sitcom just a year and a half ago, and now I'm on a ditch uh, somewhere in Connecticut, throwing up into a bank of snow. And without, you know, even looking up, I heard, I felt a pat on my back going like, you okay? Get it all out. Get it all. You're going to be all right. It's going to be okay. Don't worry about them. It's all good. And I looked up and it was Shane. It was ah. just Shane just, just being like that presence of like, hey, Yes, we're all like, you know, it's a rib dog eat dog world, but I'm here. You're fine. It's like a little moment. And I'm sure he doesn't. I mean, yes, Shane McMahon in his life of, you know, over 50 years, if you ask him his fondest memories, I'm sure patting <laughs> me on the back on an embankment in Connecticut while I'm vomiting uh, is probably not one of his top hundred memories. You don't know. It meant, to me. it meant a lot to me. And I remember just like, hey, this guy is this guy's all right. Um <laughs> turn into riding danger hey you're all right um, yeah i always liked i always appreciated that like that big brotherly type moment of like uh hey kid you're gonna be okay uh and it's something you didn't have to do he could have waited in the car old school i'm sure jr and bruce were like hey why don't we take off that would be funny make him that walk was, yeah, yeah. <laughs> uh but shane didn't do that so i always i truly you know that set the tone uh then that's the type of guy he is he's very he's very protective of uh talent and people and you know a really good friend well i know the title of this podcast <laughs> shane mcmahon help brian puke ah yes that's, that's gonna sell that's gonna those clicks that clickbait instead of attitude era and current days nah 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 to me brian can't hold down his breakfast on a <laughs> bumpy airplane ride what a baby that's gonna be the, the headline yeah i know i'm uh, you know you would hope not that I don't have them as well, but you would hope that a good vomit story involved a night of partying and alcohol <laughs> and lots of, you know, sinful, unmentionable things. But no, this is just a breakfast sandwich at the airport after a bumpy 45 minute flight. Yes. Um, but yeah, I'm sure it will. Yeah. You know, when you when you if you put this on YouTube and you get the most watched section of the podcast, definitely the Shane McMahon, myself vomit story is, you know, and I hope. This was, you know, the highlight of, of you know, of your many interviews. Oh, you know, my. You could put this in your top 10 as well. When I make the highlight reel of my amazing career, this will start it off. Yes. This will be the first. They'll be like, uh, what? Why? Why do you choose this clip? <laughs> <laughs> the guy's interviewed, uh, you know, all these other people. But the puke story? God damn. Mm -hmm. That's Steve. He knows what he's doing. Good stuff. Yeah, good stuff all around. But I got to say, thank you so much for being here on 10 Count talking about, again, 
your book that's out for hardcover and softcover right now, folks. Because again, like I said, this has been everywhere with me. And I have read many wrestling books. I just want to say that. And some, eh, they're okay. Some, you're like, oh my God, I can't put this down. Mick Foley's first book was that for me. And then I got this thing and I was like, okay, he worked there. This should be, this should be good. He's got some stories. No, it's not good. It's great. So I just want to say it's a great book. He didn't pay me to say this. I'll take PayPal if you'd like. But it, it was a great, great story. It's great filled with exciting things that no one's ever heard of that he experienced. Folks, I've been Steve Ball. He's Brian Geewertz. I'll never say his last name right just because Bruce Pritchard <laughs> did that to me. Have a great day, and we will see you next time. Bye-bye.